the main messages I took from uh, Hajj Clark's talk, there was the three points that Imam Malik showed utter lack of fear and as was mentioned, his unconquerable spirit. Again, uh, a lesson we should all learn is that sometimes this, in fact, most of the time, this is what can be enough to make people realize that the truth can never be destroyed. The other is that the, there are no heroes and villains. Uh, Imam Malik had the uh, wherewithal to actually be forgiving and had a much wider view. And I think that's something that we should also look at. There have been very unusual places where we have found help, whether we're talking about this time or others. And we should, as Muslims, uh, have the hand of friendship and forgiveness for those who actually accept that they have done wrong. And the third is injustice is not necessarily just about torture, rendition, and the things that we're used to. In interesting that the Archbishop of Canterbury was just talking about usury. And injustice can also be issues related to finance. These are things that certainly myself in my work that I do daily, the injustice that people face on a daily basis related to their lives of being in debt is important. So I think that we should have that wider view. But I'm going to go on to the next speaker who really brings it home in a contemporary way is that Imam Malik, you would be thinking that in the city of the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there would never be this kind of injustice. And even in our time, I'm going to invite Muhammad Gilu, who will tell us about the fact that these things still happen at this time. Muhammad Gilu, Jazakallah Khair. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I was a British student in Medina University into the fourth and final year of my studies. Everything seemed to be just fine until suddenly. I was kidnapped in late 2006 from my university campus by a gang of civilian dressed armed people who I later on got to know as the notorious Mabahith Saudi intelligence. I was then taken to the Saudi intelligence headquarters in Medina al Munawwara, where I was imprisoned in a small dungeon like cell, which was horrible and prone to all sorts of insects. Little did I know that I'd spend the next quarter of my life in captivity. Had I known, I would have been happy to risk my life, either escaping from the kidnappers or being shot dead on campus. This is where the disaster started. Regular interrogations, sleep deprivation, mental and, mental and physical torture, and filthy verbal abuse. They forced me to thumbprint pre-written confessions of aiding Mujahideen in Iraq. Besides the old school methods of interrogation and torture that you are probably already aware of, the prison was also no better. Calls, the prison was cold. The cells were at times cramped. The doors and windows were boarded with black sheets of metal, not allowing any sunlight through. And worst of all, the food was at times rotten and not edible. Officers and military dressed guards often barged into the cells causing havoc, searching and even at times beating people. If we were lucky, we'd get to, the, we'd get to see the sunshine for a few minutes every fortnight, otherwise, it would be months before we could ever see the sunshine again. At times, I had to hand wash my own clothes using hand soap and then wear them while they were still wet because I didn't have any spare clothes. It's hard to believe that this could go on in the city of Medina. Not only that, it was so close to the Haram that we could even hear the Adhan. Having said this, if it happened in the time of Imam Malik, to a person like Imam Malik, what would stop it from happening now? Throughout my five and a half years of imprisonment, I was moved to a number of different Mabahith prisons, including Jidda, Riyadh, and Abha. 
After two years, I was taken to court with no legal representation whatsoever. It was an illegal court, which was another invention of the Saudi Mabahith intelligence to oppress people in the name of justice and Sharia. After mentioning to the judge that I'd been tortured and forced to confess, he simply said, if you confess to all of these things, if you confess to all of these crimes, surely you must have done more things that you haven't confessed to. He then added, whether or not you did these things, you will have to bear the punishment for confessing. I was then sentenced to seven years. The UN work group on arbitrary detention adopted an opinion on my case following a submission made to them by a human rights organization, clearly urging the Saudi government to release me from what it classified as arbitrary detention. But the Saudi government had no reason to care. I assumed the British government would do something to help me. But instead, I was asked certain questions during my interrogation that could not have come from anywhere besides the UK. Within the small cells, we had close links with each other. We cared for each other. We shared clothes at times and would be extremely worried when any one of us would be taken for interrogation in case they wouldn't return. After being released in early 2012, I got in touch with other ex-detainees who were also held in al Madina al-Munawwara and tortured by their captors. The men coming from different parts of the world, including Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, were eager to get in touch with cage prisoners as they had information about an interrogation officer who tortured them, including his photograph. An official complaint was submitted to the UN about Yusuf al-Barakati, the ruthless torturer, and each individual's testimonies were submitted. A detailed report is available on Cage Prisoner's website in case you, you, you wish to know more. Lastly, I'd like to thank Cage Prisoners for giving me this opportunity to speak. Also on behalf of the, on the brothers, also on behalf of the brothers that I mentioned earlier, as I've spoken to them and each one of them really appreciated Cage Prisoner's work. I'd just like everybody to know that the world is not a safe place anymore, especially for the innocent people. The governments are not what they say they are. Justice and oppression have become two faces of the same coin. And it's up to you to make a real change. Jazakumullahu khayran wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.